How's my sound? You can hear me. Uh, I want to welcome you here today for this special symposium in honor of my colleague, distinguished professor Anna Maria Busseberger. My name is Lori San Martin, and I'm the chair of the music department and a composer on the faculty here at UC Davis. The outstanding performance given by the Coquico Ensemble last night, along with the scholarly presentations and discussions that you'll hear today, offer a rich and holistic view of improvisation and compositional processes. We also are looking forward to hearing about more about the research from such distinguished scholars today. We are proud that two of our speakers today are graduates of our very program here at UC Davis. We're happy to have you back. Uh, before I share my own thoughts about improvisation and composition, I want to thank a few folks who make this all come together so magically. My colleague Chris Reynolds flew here from Germany about 48 hours ago. And uh, in Germany and, and here in the US, he worked tirelessly on organizing all the speakers today and getting everything in order. Um, but also my colleagues Pier Paolo Polzinetti, Henry Spiller, and Pablo Ortiz, and Ana Maria herself offered wonderful input, making sure our invitation list was very good, too. Um, uh, so uh, they helped me along the way, and it really is quite a special event. Uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank our excellent production staff, Philip Daly, Joshua Patterson, Stephen Bingen, Caitlin Sapurna, Sapunor, I got it finally, Caitlin Sapunor, uh, who are always unflappable, they're meticulous, they help us with every detail of these events, and we really appreciate it. So, and thank you all for coming out today. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my experience or my ideas about improvisation, uh, and I want to start by talking about this past quarter, fall quarter, I taught a graduate seminar that was loosely based on the topic of improvisation, very loosely based on it. Um, Ana Maria was also teaching a graduate course on improvisation, um, so we were simultaneously take, teaching the same students on the topic of improvisation, uh, which ended up being quite fruitful. Some of the discussions from her class would spill over into my class and vice versa. Um, it was really rewarding. We had fascinating dialogues, um, some of which that I keep thinking about today. Um, one recurring discussion was how we defined improvisation. What is improvisation? Uh, when is composition improvisation? Uh, are composers by nature always improvising? How much of the notation in our scores represents improvisation? And how much does improvisation contribute to our process as composers? I don't know about my graduate students, but the discussion actually made me less clear on how I feel about this. <laughs> a colleague of mine mentioned a compelling idea that has stuck with me, which composition is improvisation, that writing music is a form of glacially paced improvisation. And I found this argument compelling and even comforting in how conveniently it ties improvisation to composition. But the more I thought about this, the more unease I felt about making an equivalence between composition and improvisation. I consider myself a composer, but not an improviser, or at least not one in public. <laughs> um, I still ident identify with my middle school self, who felt completely lost when it was my turn to solo in the jazz band. Uh, I might fare a bit better today, uh, but it's not my forte. Um, it didn't help that my standmate was Joshua Redman. <laughs> Um, my compositions may germinate from an improvisation created in the privacy of my studio, but the final score travels a great distance to the final outcome. But composition and improvisation share a common goal, capturing a particular moment in the time and in an immediate and compelling way. The composer who carefully crafts each gesture, phrase, and section of a large score hopes to elicit the same thrill that one experiences in listening to a tasteful improvisation. And while I know it's not exactly improvisation, one of the things I think about when writing is how to loosen up the notation and ease the strict alignment of the various parts in my music. And one of the ways I've been doing this is by using floating rhythms and floating pitches, um, which look a little bit like this. 
we lose our sense of where we are, and there's a certain freedom that's given back to the performers in creating the effect. Um, this is not a new technique by any means, and it's not improvisation, but in my mind, it's a step closer for me personally to integrating improvisational techniques, the idea of giving the performer more power to affect the outcome. Um, this example is from my 2014 double violin concerto titled We Turn in the Night in the Circle of Fire, written for, our, for Harappa Atlotodir, who's the, the uh, wonderful violinist and the wife of my colleague Mika Pelo. Uh, in the first movement, I use these floating rhythms and sounds at the beginning and the end of the movement. Um, gradually, the piece comes into focus, coming from these sounds and into focus, which also corresponds with notation becoming more fixed. Um, so if I move ahead a bit through the piece, this is the start of the piece. And then as we move forward, we start to get a little more definition of rhythms and time. And then by about measure six, we're a little bit more locked into place, a little bit more traditionally notated. So, um, the music gains intensity and it swells to a high point. In some ways, this is very traditional form, uh, sort of an arch form. And it swells to that point before returning to the floating sounds that we heard in the opening. Uh, in this piece, speaking a little more about my compositional process, in this piece, I wanted to have bits of music that would return, offering structural unity, but also a sense of evolution and progression. The idea of using motives in this way came to me while I was looking through boxes at my mom's house, boxes with items from my childhood, boxes that, remi that I remembered looking through at various points in my life. Um, there's comfort in finding things that are familiar, but there's also an element of excitement and discovery in rediscovering them. There's a sense of progression in how each of these, each time we return to a familiar item, it's a bit different than how we remembered it, that our perception of familiar objects can change over time. So thinking about these memories and boxes in my mom's house, I thought about the old record player and the old vinyl records that we listened to. The opening floating sounds of my piece imitate the white noise heard at the start of an LP record, and they close with the sounds that you hear at the end of the LP record, the same white noise. Um, the entire movement is just three minutes, so I thought I would go ahead and play it to give uh, sound to this wonderful context. Uh, again, that concert last night is inspiring me to think about sound in all sorts of new ways. Um, so again, I appreciate this conference coming together. Uh, this piece um, is a concerto for two violins with viola, cello, bass, clarinet, bassoon, trumpet, and trombone. It's a piece that was commissioned by the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players. So I'll go ahead and give it a listen, um, and we can follow the score through as well.
so thank you very much. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to turn my attention back to Ana Maria and acknowledge her tremendous contributions both to her community here at UC Davis and of course to the field as well at large. Uh, it's been really inspiring having her as a colleague, uh, as a friend, and I want to thank her for her long service and for bringing us all here together today. Thank you. I'd like to turn the microphone over to my colleague, Pier Paolo Polzanetti, who will chair the next session. Good morning. So it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, chair this first session, especially introduce our first speaker, Steve Blum, whom I met in 94. And uh, uh, he almost converted me to ethnomusicology with his beautiful study of Persian of Iranian music. But I think that he founded uh, in 1987 the ethnomusicology program at the CD College of New York Graduate Center and uh, continued to study ethnomusicology together with uh, music history, including Georgi Kurta, Charles Ives. But I think that his contribution is especially relevant today in the context of what Anna Maria is doing, her present research, bridging music history and ethnomusicology, because Steve Blum uh, wrote a lot about music history and ethnomusicology, especially relevant is the prologue to the book that he co-edited with Philip Bollman, which is uh, Ethnomusicology and Modern Music History. So without any further ado, please, Help me to, to welcome Steve Blum. Oh, thank you. Uh, can she? Uh, can someone hold? Uh, start that. Good, uh, do, I, do I hold? The, do I need the microphone? Oh, you oh. got yours. Well. Okay. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, the three terms in my title designate general concepts that are widely regarded as relevant to many musical practices research on how they are discussed in diverse languages at specific times requires attention to words for roles and actions of musicians, for resources that enable those actions, and for the results. It does not require documenting the use of a term for any of these general concepts at a given time and place. For example, in his fine essay on improvisation as concept and musical practice in the 15th century, Philippe Canguillem discusses nouns, verbs, and qualifiers pertinent to the topic without worrying about the absence of a 15th century term for the general concept of improvisation. Only a small proportion of all the terms humans have developed for thinking and talking about music have histories of cross-cultural application extending over much of the world. They are terms in modern European languages, generally with Greek or Latin antecedents, which musicians, scholars, and educators found useful as they encountered what to them were exotic musical practices and which are now used by participants in intercultural discussions. Table one on my handout lists 40 such terms used in English with cognates in other languages to designate resources with which musicians compose and improvise. It could easily be lengthened some terms like mode are more problematic than others to employ in cross-cultural work. In the final section of the long article on mode that Harold Powers contributed to the 1980 New Grove, titled Mode as a Musicological Concept, he was concerned with processes uh, he called with expansion and internationalization of the concept mode. The larger context of those processes, of course, was the expansion of European subsequently North American power through projects of colonization and empire building whose consequences are still very much with us. 
Musicians in regions colonized by Europeans deal in various ways with imported terms like mode as they participate in intercultural discussions and as they produce music theory intended to meet the needs of a modern nation. Powers argued that no coherent concept of mode will accommodate the meanings taken on in diverse situations by such terms as Javanese patet, Japanese choshi, Chinese tiao, raga in South Asian languages, or magam and its cognates in several languages of the Muslim world. In denying that these are different terms for one concept, Powers noted, for example, that the strikingly different semantic fields of the musical terms raga and magam suggests that their musical senses may have less in common than at first appears. The ethnomusicologist Mantle Hood, unlike Powers, was willing, as he put it, to hazard the guess that most musical traditions in the world are modal. Hood drew up a tentative list of four basic features of mode, which you can see on the slide or read on the handout. Only the first of Hood's features overlaps with the understanding of mode that classroom teachers promulgate when they tell students that if it's not major or minor, it's modal, pointing out the octave species available on a piano's white keys. Powers drew attention to several differences among the resources that are commonly labeled modes. Oh, I'm surprised. Gosh. Sorry. Excuse me. Um, th those two you can see on the slide now that I managed to find it. With respect to raga, Powers maintained that it is not a tune, nor is it a modal scale, but rather a continuum with scale and tune as its extremes. That's just raga. In later writings shown on the slide, Powers replaced abstract scale with tonal category, or mode one, fixed tune with melodic type, or mode two, but his insistence that raga is both at once subtly undermines that distinction. I'll add two additional differences uh, among the resources that are commonly labeled modes. Are there individual names used for spelling out sequences to be observed in performance? Are the entities organized hierarchically as a system with such categories as principle, derivative, branch, and so on? Richard Wittes, in the glossary, uh, of his book, The Ragas of Early Indian Music, Modes, Melodies, and Musical Notations from the Gupta period to circa 1250, observe that mode has become a convenient term for a set of pitches associated with a wide range of other melodic features, such as emphasized pitches or characteristic motifs and various extra musical characteristics. That wide range of features obligates scholars who use the term to specify which features come into play and how in each conception, including any rhythmic constraints. It's easy enough to do that, spelling out what the term means in a specific discussion without relying on assumptions that listeners or readers may or may not have attached to it. When he chaired a round table on Eastern and Western concepts of mode at the 1977 Congress of the IMS in Berkeley, Powers held that musicologists should reach reasonably clear understandings of individual concepts as applied to individual repertories before attempting to identify analogies. That advice makes more sense to me than for a musician, musicologist to ask how one or another theorist writing in, say, Arabic or Chinese or Sanskrit was thinking about the concept of mode prior to the internationalization of the term. Better to describe ideas developed in those languages before asking which of the ideas, if any, bear comparison with discussions of mode or whatever in other languages. As musicological concepts applied cross-culturally, composition and improvisation differ from mode in denoting creative processes or certain phases of a process or its outcome rather than resources for making music. Yet the expansion and internationalization of these two concepts raised some of the same issues that troubled powers with respect to mode, adding the question of one, how, if at all, distinctions between composition and improvisation might be relevant to cross-cultural studies of musical practices, and two, how musicians understand and carry out their responsibilities toward other participants during specific phases of a creative process. 
In addressing the first of these questions, we should follow Philippe's good example in the chapter I mentioned and keep a healthy distance from two oppositions that are as problematic with respect to 15th century Europe as to most other cultural situations. Careful planning in composition versus absence of premeditation in improvisation, writing as indispensable to composition but foreign to improvisation. Philippe notes the affinity of these familiar oppositions with the concept of orality that treats it as primarily a condition with predictable consequences in the social life of pre-literate communities. Haun Sosi, in a book with the subtitle Orality and Its Technologies, cited at the bottom of page two on the handout, also notes that the equivalence of paper with premeditation and of hearing with immediacy remain in the background of some theories of oral composition. So C is correct that in his words, the oral and the literate are mixed, interrelated, or overlaid in the great majority of cases as they stand. It's high time for scholars to stop repeating what Jonathan Stern termed the audiovisual litany. I've reproduced that litany as table two on page two, hoping that as you read it now or later, you'll feel the absence of any compelling reason to experience the world through all these oppositions between hearing and seeing. Orality is best used as a general term for multiple techniques by which people remember portions of what we hear and then repeat or vary as we speak, sing, or play an instrument. In a lecture titled, What is Orality, If Anything?, Ruth Finnegan, an important scholar of oral literature, concluded that there is nothing clear, definite, or agreed to which that abstract noun can refer. Sounds like powers on mode. Finnegan, nonetheless, finds that the term has, used, has served useful functions. I'd say in meth that in musicology, one of those has been to direct scholarly attention to diverse techniques of oral composition and oral transmission in literate and non-literate societies alike. We need far more studies of the responsibilities that participants assume during specific phases of a compositional process. Even a single sentence in a treatise may indicate a couple of phases. According to Al-Farabi, the great Abbasid court singer Ishaq al mosili stated that melodies are weavings engendered by men and improved by women. Indeed, stories in the massive book of songs of Alice Bahani tell of male composers who were quite eager to teach a new song phrase by phrase to a female singer. In early Arabic music theory, results of compositional processes were distinguished by different plurals of the noun lahan for different types of melodic construction. Tatlif al-Alhan produced melodies with rhythmic cycles, while Tatlif al-Luhun resulted in melody types or schemata that provided a basis for further composition. The phases of a compositional process are often more complex than the three-phase model suggested by Bruno Nettle of pre-composition, composition, revision. Speaking to the French ethnomusicologist Gilbert Rouget, Sedemek Pont described the sequence of actions she followed when the king of Porto Novo in Benin, a former French colony, commissioned a new song for his court music. I've summarized uh, the protocol on page two of the handout. First, the sick king commissions a new song for a specific ceremony. Second, the composer invites the singers among his wives to her home for the necessary rituals. Third, she's alone to compose the song. Fourth, she fine tunes her work with help from the best of the palace singers. Fifth, she invites all the singers again to learn and rehearse the song. Sixth, she presents the song to the king. Seventh, with his approval, it's performed at the right moment in the ceremony. Finally, the composer is protected by not revealing her name in case someone was offended by part of it, which is entirely possible. I cannot accept the anthropologist Jack Goody's claim that only a written text permits analysis, as I'm not willing to assume that neither the best of the palace singers in Porto Novo nor female singers of the Abbasid courts were not capable of analyzing orally composed music, though I'll grant that uh, supporting this claim uh, would require discussion of how analysis of music uh, may differ from the analysis of verbal texts that Goody was thinking of. Here's a short song from the court music of King Befa, 
uh, on page three of the handout, you can read a transcription of text and melody as they relate to the timeline played on the large bell uh, in the photo, a uh, male iron bell in the photo. The beginning and end of the timeline is marked by double lines in the transcription, uh, and the composer has calculated each phrase of her melody to start in the second half of the timeline, extend over the full pattern, and continue through the first half. We can think of that as a grid, to use a term that Anna Maria uses so nicely in her book on memory. <laughs> A careless reading of the title of our symposium might see it as assuming that improvisation is one kind of activity, compositional process quite another, even though the operative conjunction in our title is and, not or. I read the and as a potential reminder that scholars, educators, and musicians often qualify the words composition and improvisation with such modifiers as oral composition, composition in performance, composition in real time, composing for improvisers, recomposition, and even re-improvisation. All marked terms on the slide come from effort, efforts to identify a process lacking some features associated with the general unmarked term such as transmitted in writing or carried out before performance. In my experience, ethnomusicologists studying the musical terminology of a language generally find more words that refer to composition than to improvisation, which is often taken for granted as the norm in singing or playing, with no need to highlight differences from other ways of making music. Uh, here you can see a few examples from Arabic, the two terms for improvisation were extended from improvised orations to uh, improvised music making at different points. It would be interesting to compare the various situations in which improvisation is marked, as in Indian music, where informed listeners recognize improvisation on the raga itself or on a composition they have just heard in the performance. In certain situations, observers with little or no background knowledge can recognize improvisation when they notice participants ap appreciating spontaneous actions as a performance proceeds. An instrumentalist who wishes to perform Persian traditional music must memorize pre-composed melodic sequences and must learn to improvise a response to each phrase of whatever verses the solo vocalist has chosen to sing to his or her version of the pre-composed sequences. Singer and instrumentalist are both performing those sequences in an order they are free to alter somewhat, and both are expected to extemporize details that will be most meaningful to those who know one or another of the pre-composed versions, which I would call texts, even though the best musicians will not have learned them from notations. An instrumentalist's response should relate to what the singer has just done with the phrase without sounding like a mechanical repetition. If we choose to speak of improvisation here, we can do so without denying that members of a string quartet can also make spontaneous responses, of course, as they hear a colleague play a passage in a way they haven't heard before. The fact that our contemporaries associate improvisation with spontaneity does not banish spontaneity from other modes of performance. Here is the initial line of a ghazal by the Persian poet Hafez as sung by Hatam Askari with responses on the sitar by his close friend Daryush Safat. The text is on page four of the handout as well as on the screen with the long and short syllables marked in the pattern short, long, short, long, short, short, long, long, short, long, short, long, short, short, long. Ravaga man zarachash na man ash yane hatost. Ravaga man. 
چشم من آشیان توست کرم نما و فرودا کرم نما و فرودا که خان خانه تو In the final chapter, no, I'm sorry, appreciation of spontaneity or the unpredictability that results from a relative abundance of options or a lack of self-consciousness and willingness to, to take risks on the part of performers, many of our contemporaries associate any or all of these with improvisation, but I don't think they provide us with criteria for recognizing improvisation in practices of other times and places. In the final chapter of the recently published Oxford Handbook of Critical Terms in Music Theory, titled Beneath Improvisation, the pianist, composer, scholar Vijay Iyer writes that, as you read, we cannot know whether an action is improvised just by observing it in a vacuum. Um, we perceive improvisation through systems of difference. In other words, perceptions of improvisation depend on the relevant systems of difference, which often involve differences in the resources used and in how they are used. Three papers presented at the 2003 conference of the Pan-African Society for Music Arts Education and subsequently published are titled Improvisation, Oral Composition, and Written Composition. The authors of oral composition see that topic as referring specifically to most music making by the people of Africa. It can also refer, of course, to most music making of humans in the course of our long history, nowhere more so than in South Asia. South Asian musicologists don't need to mark oral composition as a special variety of the general concept. South Asian theorists have been able to an analyze music that is orally composed and transmitted. Genres like film music that require written transmission at certain points in the creative process are a recent development in India's music history. The Ghanaian ethnomusicologist Kwasa Ampena is interested in, quote, a continuum that is evident in pre-performance composition and in composition during performance, end quote. He points out that the subject of oral composition has received only marginal and cursory treatment in ethnomusicological studies. Ampena's book on one genre of women's song among the Akan of Ghana has a chapter on motivations for the creative process, and the six motivations he identifies make a better case for oral composition and recomposition than for improvisation. In the genre he's describing, the creative process recognizes fixed and authentic texts which exist prior to performance, and recompositions are based on certain learned formulas in the tradition. Speaking in Tui, an experienced singer described her technique of calculating and joining words, sometimes by stretching them a little bit, Ampena understood her to be talking about how she times articulation of the words to the timeline. In the transcription on page five of the handout, he notes, notates the timeline's three strokes in two measures of six, eight. I'll count the two measures in four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Rather than using measure numbers in his transcription, Ampena numbers each occurrence of the timeline over its final stroke and he also numbers what he hears as the final moment in each vocal phrase. So both of those sequences of sounds are directed toward their end point. The only moments in the notation where those two end points coincide are numbered four and eight.
Ampena is forthright about his hesitation to use the term improvising with reference to this vocal genre, since he wishes to avoid the implication of composition without forethought. He insists that, in his words, we should ask whether the African musician considers what he does an improvisation. No one would suggest that African musicology could do without that term, but it should not be imposed on any creative process that doesn't rely on written transmission. The association of improvisation with absence of planning, which Philippe rightly calls a modern misconception, motivated Ampena to avoid the term as he described the creative process in one Akan vocal genre. With respect to the musical practices of India, Wittes suggests that spontaneous processing might be a more satisfactory term than improvisation, again to emphasize the many ways performers use knowledge and habits they have internalized. Adopting new perspectives on improvisation and compositional process should entail looking frankly at the harm that's been done from some of the old, pra the old uh, perspectives. In a lecture delivered in 1994 at a joint meeting of several music societies and published the following year, the improvising composer scholar George Lewis forcefully criticized uses of concepts of improvisation in academic circles of this country that ob obstructed any understanding of what African-American musicians had been doing for decades. He argued that a number of Euro-American composers active in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s had favored such terms as indeterminacy, aleatory, chance operations, experimental music, even non-jazz improvisation, in order to avoid any hint of a non-white sensibility in their music. He recognized the biases in histories of American music that were preventing them from probing musical consequences of the interactions among the nation's diverse populations. Lewis's paper is one of the founding documents of what has come to be known as critical improvisation studies. Some of you may have seen the open access online journal published by the International Institute for Critical Studies in Improvisation at the University of Guelph in Ontario. Musical improvisation is a crucial model for political, cultural, and ethical dialogues and action, we read on the website of an earlier project of the Institute's founders. Lewis is one editor of the massive Oxford Handbook of Critical Improvisation Studies, and that title now designates an approach to even to ethnomusicological theory that receives half a chapter in a book published last year titled Theory for Ethnomusicology. In my view, labeling different varieties of theory tends to inhibit people from thinking outside the carefully labeled boxes, but it's now, I'm sorry to say, a fairly common practice in our academic institutions, not <clears throat> only in music study. I'm not convinced that we need even a rough definition of the relationship between composition and improvisation as a pair of terms for musicological purposes. If we do, I'd offer something along the lines of terms for diverse creative processes that often extend through multiple phases, some of which are best described as one or the other, some of which can be understood as either or as both at once, depending on one's engagement with creative processes as they relate to other areas of our lives. Thank you. I, I feel I'm uh, thank you. I'm honored to hear that. Is he still singing uh, Sumerian songs? Yeah, oh, okay, <laughs> that wasn't his finest hour. <laughs> Is, 
gets more interesting. <laughs> Thank you. I don't see well also if you can, yeah, you can identify people. Barely, um, I'll go closer. This is a hard room for discussions. <laughs> Well, I mean, improvisation is one of our topics, of course, of this. And as we know, there are uh, people trotting around from one corporation to the next, giving little workshops on how to make your workers <laughs> into a better team through improvisation and whatnot. But uh, we can't separate our concepts from what's going on. I, uh, it would take time that we don't have, I guess, to explore those. But to, to go back to your point about education, uh, I think we all can be inspired by Anna Maria's wonderful work as we honor her today to look m more than we have in the past about how people learn to do the things that they then do, the habits they acquire and the way they, and it, I mean, this relates again to what Richard Teruskin was just saying. We can look at what what is actually done and it's rather shocking actually that with the amount of material that's published in various periods of societies that so little is said about how people learned to do the things um, that uh, we we see the results and we don't uh, we eat the dinner sort of <laughs> left over but we don't know how it was made and we should be more interested in that <laughs> thank you Okay, um, so we have a, our second speaker is Jesse Rodi from Stanford University, who, if, if you liked the concert last night in Stanford, 
Coquelico, he does that similar kind of work with the ensemble Cat Circle, with the facsimile singers at Stanford, recreates ceremonies, sings from the original books in original notations, and beautiful example of practices research, which doesn't mean that he also does the more traditional kind of research which is contextual musicology, as in his book on uh, Josquin's Rome, studies of materialities, as in uh, the songbook, a sensory artifact, and uh, published many articles on Josquin and recorded OK games, songs, and other uh, music of the time. So please welcome Jesse Rodri. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. Am I on? Yes, I think so. Can anyone, ah, premature. There's a handout that I just wanted to make sure it goes around. But you don't need it at the very beginning, so I'll just start. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not crucial to have. Great. Well, we know they memorized something, at least Sometimes. I'm speaking about the French song repertory of the 15th century, which survives mainly in small format songbooks that from the perspective of modern performers are a giant pain in the ass. <laughs> Let's assume for the sake of argument that you can read the French text and musical notation fluently. Let's also assume that you have enough experience performing chanson that you can make the words of each poetic line fit the given notes even though the words are, as usual in this period, plopped down on the page without attention to the placement of individual syllables. This still leaves the problem of the song's repetitive form. Having sung the A section, you turn the page to perform the B section, where, helpfully enough, and only because this is a virile, two texts appear one underneath the other. Now you turn the page back to where you started and face a challenge of a different order. You have to fit the words at the bottom of the page, that's the blue box, to a melody you've only sung once. A melody that is long, that has a wide range, that is rich in syncopations, and that is vocally unforgiving. A melody whose rests last only a single beat, leaving little time to mentally regroup, and for which the text underlay, the syllable to syllable underlay, that is, is not intuitive. My example, by the way, is Johannes Ockegem's Ma Maîtresse, one of the best songs of the period though I could have made roughly the same argument by picking a song out of a hat. Let's hear the first A section and the beginning of the first B. And now I can ask if anyone cannot yet see a handout. You have the text of the song on the first page. It looks like they're almost there, so I'm just gonna start. Ma
It's a gorgeous song, and as far as Johannes Tinctoris was concerned, an intensely composed piece that is exemplary of its genre. Indeed, in formality, textural density, and overall contrapuntal complexity, it is not far from sacred polyphony, from the stylistic worlds of the mass and motet. Speaking of masses and motets, if we think about what it was like to perform such pieces, we find ourselves on a different planet. Here the singers are arrayed in front of a large choir book, with the where the words are present from start to finish, or are so familiar they don't have to be, and where repeating a musical section with new words is not a thing. When reading from such books, trained singers could make the music go on the first try, and if problems came up, another run through or two, and they'd have it. I'm not suggesting they didn't rehearse, I'm just saying that almost all the music is sight readable. Against this backdrop, the song repertory seems special. The books, at least the ones we have, are more or less too small to facilitate performances by three or more people, and there are words you have to sing that don't appear underneath the notes. And we haven't even talked about the lower voices yet. Scholars have been arguing for decades about how the tenor and contratenor should be performed, with the should accounting for why the debate has mostly not been very productive. I recently published an article suggesting that the mise en page we find over and over again in Chansonnier suggests that the lower voices often, not always, sang the words. Part of the argument is precisely about memorization. We know the highest voice had to memorize something. Why is it a stretch to say that the tenor and contra had to do the same? Behind this question lies another. Why, in a world in which highly trained singers were so often used to having a complete and fully sight-readable text in front of them, were songs copied in a way that forced on the performers additional rehearsal? Echoing the work of Jane Alden, one answer is that to the extent that songbooks were luxury objects not too far removed from the realm of books of hours, performance practices had to trail behind the chansonnier's main function. In other words, the singers had to memorize because the manuscript was there, mainly for a fancy person to follow along with, or to display as a visually extravagant abstraction of the performance, a material signifier of wealth, personalized by virtue of the small size, that complemented another material signifier of wealth, the singing bodies being paid by said fancy person. A second answer, not unrelated, is that bookmaking was a time-consuming and expensive endeavor. Space was at a premium. Copying the same music multiple times for the sake of complete text underlay would surely have been considered overkill, particularly in a world in which, as Anna Maria has helped us understand, a highly trained musical memory was a given. Through composed copies of songs may even have been seen to diminish a book's status by introducing a degree of visual, which is to say notational, sameness at odds with late medieval aesthetic priorities. Taken together, these circumstances gave rise to performance situations that encouraged a unique sort of engagement with the audience, a word I will not place in scare quotes, by the way. Unlike the fundamentally corporate quality of church polyphony, regardless of how many individuals are involved, chansons were probably performed on most occasions by three singers who interacted closely with one another. This is the demediatized liveness I am getting at in my title, and I'm thinking more Phelan than Auslander. Now, I don't want to draw this contrast too sharply. Even complex sacred polyphony, the kind for which the notation is indispensable, depends on close coordination among the performers, who must constantly react to rhythmic and pitch material in the other voices, and who, because of the spatial effect produced by singing together from a single large book, this in an age before deodorant, are plunged into a musical experience characterized by intensity and intimacy. Still, when singing songs, there are two additional variables at play. First, that the repetitions and quasi-repetitions built into the standard forms demand a different kind of engagement with both music and text. You have to decide how to shape identical music to fit the shifting affects of the poem. And second, related, that the memorization all but required to bring off a successful performance invites a heightened level of interpersonal interaction with, we can surmise, significant eye contact both among the performers and with those watching. When you spend time with the poems, you realize they are rich in contrast. Each envelops us in a story, usually a sad story, and an emotional journey with an idiosyncratic mix of ups and downs. It is ludicrous to imagine, as so many modern performers still do, that these texts should be declaimed with all the pathos you'd bring to a blender manual. 
Once you give up that idea, you realize that memorizing the song is the best and perhaps the only way of committing fully to what is happening, poetically and musically. Indeed, the intensity and intimacy that book-free delivery invited invite us, in turn, to shed our 21st century baggage about the bookishness of carefully crafted, workish polyphony. Yes, the notes are there on the page, but making them come alive is anything but a dutiful or mechanical process. The makers of songs, many of them singers, knew all of this. They saw the form fixe as horizons of opportunity. Each formal scheme makes possible a unique world of aesthetic experiences, experiences composers could manipulate in a thousand ways and performers bring across in a thousand more. David Fallows, who along with Christopher Page has written eloquently about the rondeau, has characterized the virile as a modified rondeau form. Fallows knows more about songs than almost anyone, but with respect to the virile, he is, to use one of his favorite turns of phrase, quite wrong. First, let me remind you about the lowercase letters. Each refers to unique non-refrain text. In other words, the music is in two sections, A and B. Textual repetition is confined to the beginning and the, A, and the end of the song, the capital A's. Now that we have that straight, I want to point out two things about the virile that make it distinct and that I do not think have been adequately appreciated. First, the song ends with the A music. This means that the arrival at the end of A has to be strong enough to work as the conclusion to a piece that might last seven minutes, but also flexible enough to withstand three performances. Second, the B section is heard twice in immediate succession, then never again. In the sources, A and B are often separated by a page turn. Indeed, after the opening A section, virelays tend to move into a completely different world with a significant change of character in both music and text. We stay in this new world for a little while, then we turn the page back to the A section, and the B music is lost forever. It is but a memory, albeit a memory that can now make us hear the A music differently. For all these reasons, the B section almost has to begin with a turn of some kind, a way of marking a new and foreign country, while at the same time allowing the A music to conclude with sufficient but not excessive finality. Since I can't play a dozen virales for you, which is what it would take to really get the idea, I will try to say something specific about one and something general about the whole corpus. The specific thing is about another, even more famous virale by Okagem, Ma Boucherie. This is your next, uh, on the handout you have the text and then the full score with the translation uh, in, in the score. As is common in these pieces, the poem does half the work in its division between A and B and you have the song form off to the left of the text as an up here. The lamenting speaker goes from rejoicing in the possibility that death will end his suffering, how cheering, to directly addressing his deceitful heart with a series of closely spaced rhymes at the beginning of B. Ah, cœur pervers, faussaire et mensongère. In other words, our subject shifts from pretending to be happy to cursing. The music follows suit with a shift of mensuration from C to cut C that you will know if you have read Anna Maria's first book indicates an acceleration of the tempo. Curiously enough, virtually every recording I was able to consult, and there are many, neglects to accelerate at the beginning of B, a circumstance that helps explain why we have been slow to come to grips with virales more generally. At all events, I have recorded this song for a soon to appear album of Okagam's complete sec secular music, Megalomaniacally, I will play it now, asking you to listen not only for the turn at the beginning of the B section, but also for the turn back to A. Uh, we'll listen a bit past that moment of return. Ma
As I hope comes through in this performance, it's not just the text and mensuration change that make the B section catch our ears. It's also the sudden shift to syllabic writing and the introduction of upper voice imitation in a predominantly homorhythmic context. And then, on returning to A, we encounter, again, the drippingly slow and rhythmically sparse opening, votre pitié, that, in the shadow of the excitable B, dramatizes a desire for death. That shadow of B is central. Having unleashed, but then abandoned, a faster, angrier affect, the hopeless, lugubrious A section feels more, still more hopeless and still more lugubrious. This is true even for the concluding refrain, ma boucherie, which is amplified not only by the shadow of B effect, but also by the poem, which tells us that the whole laughing mouth, weeping mind thing is a performance, a ruse whose only purpose is to make it possible to go on living. When I recorded this song last summer, some of us had tears in our eyes in between takes. But we also felt there was something that there was deeper to dig, that the performative possibilities afforded by formal repetition, memorization, interpersonal interaction, and deeper repertorial knowledge had the potential to take us further. Okay, now the general point about virilets. It's a simple one, really. A lot of them, including all four of Okagams, do this. In a graduate seminar I taught last year, the students assembled all the 15th century virilets, there are about 100, into a spreadsheet, tracking above all the shift from A to B. A change of mensuration occurs about one third of the time. Changes in texture and text setting procedures are still more common. And here's another cute trick. In one out of four virilets, the B section introduces a note that is higher than the melodic high point of the A section. This means that B breaks through the melodic ceiling, often dramatically, and then when A returns, we are haunted by the high point's absence. Taking all of these procedures together, the virile emerges as a powerful and flexible affective template. Now, everything I have been saying thus far has skirted the question of whether and to what extent performance was an occasion for melodic decoration and other real-time transformations of the notated music. So let's stipulate that the singers could decorate and transform without great effort. And, and we don't need to stipulate because we heard a series of spectacular examples last night. If they could, why wouldn't they? And what better candidate for such elaborations than the opening of Ma Boucherie with its, for Akagem, sparse as hell texture? There is no doubt singers could decorate this passage on the fly. I'll even bet whoever was still singing this song in 1520 or 1550 did just that. I'll remind you of the opening. But I know that Anna Maria likes bold and controversial scholarship, and so I will now provoke you by arguing that singers of Ockeghem's time would not have opted here for an ornamental free-for-all. The argument is in two parts. The first part goes back to what I've been saying about how the A and B sections relate. Ockeghem's setting, as it comes down to us, dramatizes the poem's twists and turns through, among other things, shifts in rhythmic density. If you really want to convey the depth of despair on returning to the slower A music, you embrace the syncopation-free musical sludge Ockeghem has given you. To decorate these rhythms is to miss what the song is about. The second part of the argument, which applies more generally, concerns the limits of human concentration and attention. The more the singers are inventing melodic material, calculating contrapuntal relationships, and communicating these decisions through hand gestures and raised eyebrows, the less mental space they have to be shaping a unique poem as it unfolds. These goals are not mutually exclusive, of course, but no matter how expert we think they were, we have to acknowledge a balance, a seesaw. On the one side, we find a technical, arithmetic sort of thinking, wherein the singers coordinate their melodic and rhythmic movements to create non-notated sounds. Even if we assume that these techniques, trained from a young age, were all but automatic, in-the-moment decision-making still demands considerable focus. On the other side, we find an expressive, emotional kind of thinking, less often talked about with respect to this repertoire, but inescapable when you spend enough time with the notes and the words. Mental processes of this kind, which allow the singers to coordinate their bodies and minds with the aim of entering fully into a song's poetics, are at least as taxing as the more technical, mathematical kind. And we must, of course, remember that no matter what the context, the singers had to negotiate vocal challenges, thinking about placement, tuning, and vowel color. 
It's a lot to keep in your head. Behind this lies another issue having to do with how these songs were made. Anna Maria has helped us appreciate the extraordinary extent to which composers could conceive of multiple independent voices in the mind. What I would like to suggest is that this idea comes with a catch. The more we want to say that the act of creation could take place equally in the mind or on the page, the less the distinction matters. If we assert, that is, that the pen and the page are extensions of the mind, and that the kinds of imagination and abstraction necessary for compositional activity can occur in both arenas, then we are unlikely to find significant differences between one medium of creative activity and the other. Surprisingly, in the mind and on the page become one and the same. Of course, that's not, not all there is to it. The on-the-page copies that have come down to us reflect a significant process of editing, of shaping ideas that work contrapuntally into finely wrought finished pieces. Nowhere is this more evident than the form fixe chanson, whose repetition schemes encourage an extraordinary attention to detail. Ockagam settings, in Ockagam settings, you get the sense that every note is there for a reason. Individually and as a group, these songs repay close analysis. The more we accept that editing has taken place, the more we think about why they bothered to copy all these choir books and chansonniers in the first place, the more we delve into the poetics of these chansons, the more I want to have my cake and eat it. I want to say that these are highly composed and rather fixed works. I also want to say that they share with non-notated practices a huge range of contrapuntal procedures that singers could learn to produce on the spot. It's neither an either or nor a both and. It's a Venn diagram. Returning to the idea of memorized, intimate performances, I will leave you with one last provocation. When we talk about musical activity that takes place off the page, is it possible that our focus has been too exclusively technical? If we want to understand what it was like to have internalized, repertoire, uh, internalized a repertoire of interval combinations and contrapuntal progressions, shouldn't we also want to know more about how they created riveting, in-the-moment musical experiences? Addressing this question means broadening our imaginative horizon about what counts as performance practice and improvisation. It means delving ever more deeply into the repertoire. And it means stopping to notice that the buttoned up, formalized academies that constitutes our performative playground, this sentence included, was not theirs. They lived at a time when crying in the streets was not just okay, but necessary to convey the depths of sorrow one might feel at the loss of a loved one. A song like Ma Boucherie reflects those feelings directly and passionately. Let's listen for them. Thank you. We have time for questions. Chris Reynolds. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm wondering about the story you know better than I of Josquin getting angry because he came upon musicians who were adding notes to what he had written. Um, does that not suggest that, in fact, that's a normal activity um, at this point? And then uh, how do you, in tabulations for lute or keyboard factor into your thinking? or polyphonic mass settings of a chanson, which um, inevitably add counterpoints that were not there. Great, thank you. Um, so that story, of course, is by some thought to be apocryphal. I don't, I don't actually care whether it's true or not. What's interesting about it is that we have it, so it reflects some sort of value. Um, I think my answer would be that we, that we have a spectrum, right? That we have, we have composed works where there's so much attention to, the det to detail, where there's so much editing that has happened, that sure, that a by a certain moment, the composer could come to care very much that it, that it be carried off in that way. I mean, that's a concept that is certainly familiar later. Um, but that, that intersects in all sorts of complex ways with, with everything you just mentioned, right? Where there's a freedom to transform these, these so-called fixed things, to create in the moment things that resemble them, uh, and, and, and that that range of practices is just part of their world, whereas for us there's maybe a, a, a thicker line separating them. Maybe Elisa, 
I, um, the phrase learning by heart comes to mind. Um, I don't know how old that phrase is, but I want to ask you about whether you have a, ideas or maybe even a program about um, reintroducing memorization in education, whether of young singers or just in general in the classroom. It's, it's fallen quite far out of favor in many contexts. And the idea that memorization actually gives emotional access to what's being performed, I think, is something that could use a boost. Yeah. I just wonder if you'd like to speak to that. No, thanks so much for that question. Um, I just, I was lucky enough last, uh, last month, yes, to teach a course at Stanford where we, a group of 13 students and I, plus there was a photo, there was a photo of this actually, sang from a, a real live 15th century um, chant book, Florentine chant book from the late 1430s, beautifully preserved. And uh, because we were able to have the course on a, on a compressed time frame, we sang the same chants, two in particular, many, many times over the course of, of a week and a half, so that by the time of the concert, we had it all but memorized. And then after that followed a three-week period of a kind of regular class where we met twice a week. And the first thing I did was have them just try to sing it. It's a long piece, but just have them try to sing it, maybe with the words, but ultimately without. And we could do it. And the kinds of insights they were able to, we, I think were all able to bring to what was going on in the music, you know, how the whole thing worked, seemed so much more, so much deeper because we had that internalized knowledge. We all kind of felt that way. And it's true that it's gone out of fashion, mere rote memorization. I mean, I think in the American educational system since the, certainly the 70s, you know, this has been the kind of view. But it's, it's really nonsense. There needs to be a balance and memorization needs to be part of, of the picture. I mean, I tried when making this recording to memorize all the texts. Uh, you know, and I'm not a native French speaker and it's 15th century French, but it's not that bad to do. And once you do it, you, you have this other set of powers around the pieces that I just don't know how else you can get. We have Richard Terask and then Carol Hess. Uh, Jesse, could you put your um, slide back where you compare the uh, Virile and the Rondeau? Sure. I'm gonna uh. do something I've never done before. <laughs> I'm going to defend David Fallows. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't because <laughs> you said that he was quite wrong uh, to say that the one form is uh, somehow a variant of the other. Well, you know, in both forms, you've got a verse and you've got refrains. If you take away the refrains and just concentrate on the verse, the verses are the same. Uh, because we have a uh, refrain that comes before the verse, in the case of the virile, the verse looks like it begins with the B. But if you take away the refrains, you have the same AAB for the virile as you have for the rondeau, and of course that AAB is the ballade. So all of the fixed, for, fixed forms, form fixed, are the same verse, but differently embedded with refrains. Uh, the big difference, as you well demonstrated, between the virile and rondeau is a rhetorical one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the virile is a heart on sleeve, declaimed kind of thing uh, that uh, makes a great deal out of the uh, contrast between the refrain and, and the verse. But the verse is the same verse. Yeah, I suppose at a structural level one could say that. I mean, in the, in the virile, if we're, call, if we're calling the A the refrain, then, there's, then the rondeau, the refrain, is the whole music. Right, in the virile, it's, it's part of the music. So, you know... Right. But it seems like, you know, and, and Fallows' method is, is a comparison of kind of cadential structures in two pieces. But again, it seems like the, the rhetorical reality of what, the, of what these things do, they're so far apart, right? In the rondeau, what's the trick? It's that you have to, it's that you hear the whole thing once and then you withhold. You, you sing A, 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 you know, and when are we going to get B again? And that stopping in the middle is this whole other kind of thing. And then finally B happens again. Um, Whereas the virile, right, I've described this other kind of, so I think kind of they're just in such different yeah, domains. You've memorized the forms. Uh, right. I, if you think about verses and refrains, it looks very, very different. I still think they're really far apart. I mean, whatever words we use. Last question, Carol Hess. 
Thank you very much. That was fascinating. I never thought about being on a performative playground before. So, um, I know from uh, Anna Maria has laid out the fact that there were many strategies for memorizing. Um, we think of the memory palaces and and such things. But I wonder if there were people who simply had poor memories and nonetheless wanted to be musicians. I'm thinking of being a piano teacher for many years and having students in a panic because they were going to have a memory slip. And would that be disqualifying if they were had a fine voice and were sensitive musically? Do you have any literature about people being in a panic because they might not have a good memory? Alas. I mean, I think it's certainly possible. Um, they'd be at a great disadvantage. To get to the point where these books would be useful to, to you, it takes quite a lot of training and experience that would depend on building precisely that memory. So the idea that you would be deficient in memory but still have access through these books is almost kind of counterintuitive, I think, for the period. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question, right? Like, how can, can you be a musician in that period without having this highly trained memory? What would that look like? So at this point, um, we thank Jesse Roddy for this beautiful presentation. <laughs> and uh, we have a coffee break or a break of some kind, and we'll reconvene at 10.55, 10.55.